This is Indianapolis coach, Reggie Wayne, and you're listening to the For the Culture podcast. This is the For the Culture podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, and joining me today on the show, Colts defensive end, Kamoko Ture. Kamoko, appreciate you taking time out of your day to be with us here on the For the Culture podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, man. No, no problem. Of course, it's my pleasure to have you on. And first and foremost, how are you feeling? Let's knock out the injury stuff first. How are you feeling now, a couple weeks removed from surgery, to your broken ankle? I mean, mentally, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling great, man. Just trying to keep my um, the mindset going. Just, you know, like they say, you know, positive mind, increase the um, positive, you know, healing and um, increase the, you know, the healing process. So I just try to stay positive and do things, you know, stay around my team. You know, if I, when I go to the like, facility, stay positive around my teammates and, you know, showing them and they ain't nothing to worry about, be back in you know, full health, you know, within six months or whatever. Yep, and a lot of people forget about the mental aspect to an injury and recovering from an injury. People always think physical, physically you broke your ankle, physically you had surgery on it, but the mental aspect is very important. And you talked about staying around and being with your teammates. How important is it to you to stay around the team, be around the team on a weekly or daily basis while going through the rehabilitation process? I mean, I want to be a part of the process, you know, and whatever I can to stay around the teammates. You know, now I can't be there physically, but just mentally being around them. And just you know, just show um, mental support, and just you know, being just being their number one fan, being there around them, and just you know, any advice I could I'll give them, just watching film and and what I've seen, just watching film in my spare time at home, and and certain things I see and things that I see that um, could enlighten you know the the defensive line and certain you know certain you know players like you know um, Quan, Abdi Muhammad, you know me and him, we like you know we like real close from the same hometown, so usually I watch film we. You know, we we usually get input um, on certain things on like uh, opponents that we go against. So, you know, like little, doing the little things that I, I'm I got to do and you know, control what I can control and try to help the team out. Yeah, I think that's so important, and it's great to hear, especially because when you come back, you want to stay sharp mentally, and you don't want to be a step behind. So that's really important. And going forward now with the rehab, do you have goals for yourself, checkpoints over the upcoming weeks and upcoming months throughout the course of your rehabilitation process? Uh, I mean, I'm just trying to do everything I can to make sure this you know healing process comes out 100%, and not trying to do anything strenuous. Um, but I'm also like, you know, doing what the doctor is telling me, you know, rest and be smart. Don't uh, stay off my feet, um, you know, but I'm just trying to have for it, you know, um, you know, just, you know, staying positive and uh, doing what I could do. Control, like I said, like control what I can control, like working my upper body, strengthening and stuff like that. Um, I, I have currently got my my uh, cast on right now, but once I take that off and I'm just, I'm ready to go, you know, get, getting the, um, the uh, rehab going for my leg. Do you have a date yet for when you expect to be back out there at 100%? I know you said something before about six months. Is that six months until you're 100% or six months until you get the cast off and you can start to run again? Do you have any type of timeline right now? I know it's still early, but do you have a timeline right now for when you expect to get back out there? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the doctor says it's going to probably take six to eight months for um, the recovery uh, recovery to heal. But you know, with my um, my with my you know mentality, you know, um, I'm just you know I'll say six months because like I'm be I'm, I'm throwing this off season. I'm just be working hard and you know just you know um, I've been doing little videos on the IG, stay on IG, you know, try to show the um, fans and uh, the healing process and you know me working out and um, just showing them you know the journey to me you know from start to finish and now what I do off the field and whatever is, you know, show them, you know, that I'm, I'm going to be back. I'm going to be back ready to go coming next April. Yep. And I follow you on Instagram. So I've seen your stories. You definitely seem like you're in good spirits right now. You seem very confident in the rehabilitation process. And what's the best piece of advice you've gotten up until this point from a teammate who may have gone through the same injury or a similar injury and has that at all helped you handle this situation in such a positive way? Um, the re- the reason why I'm dealing with this uh, in a positive way because of um, I've seen Darius um, hurt himself in, uh, during the uh, camp and and it was like it was like it was sad and and just and just to watch him observe how he handled the situation and just motivated me as well and uh, he's the first person I thought of that uh, and Marcus um, another player who got hurt in uh, Jahad Ward who also got an ankle injury. And then all these guys who kept that positive energy, it kind of motivated me. And just like, yo, everything's going to be all right. And to see the outcome, how they you know, constantly just kept improving, 
each and every day and uh, for uh, for them constantly stay on top of their, you know, daily routine and listen to uh, what the coach is telling them to do and just being involved. So I, I, I've, I've learned by observing and watching them and it's motivated me and, get, and got me better mentally and physically. We're talking to Colts defensive end Kamoko Ture here on the For the Culture podcast. Ture, you talked about staying with the team up until this point, how important that is to you to stay sharp mentally, help out your teammates, and be with the guys. Is that the plan now moving forward? Do you plan on remaining with the team for the duration of the 2019 season? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm just um, focused on developing the mental um, part of the game and you know, studying film and learning how to um, study my opponent and just, you know, and just getting better at that, that standpoint and just being around my teammates and being around the meeting and just staying involved, you know, and just feeling like, no, I'm a part. Like I don't want to ever feel like I was never like you know like just watching the game last week playing against the Houston and when I was winning. It was like yo, and I was talking to the guys and just communicating. I just felt like I was there, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't want to ever be like that. I want to ever be disconnected. So I feel like I'm an uh, outsider. So I just try to stay involved in whatever and just you know stay top of my um, my my rehab and just you know strengthening and try to get back as you know as soon as possible. Let me ask you, when you watched the Texans game on your couch, did you go full maniac like Darius Leonard and go shoulder pads, jersey, helmet? Did you dress up for the game like Darius Leonard? Oh, um, I had <laughs> I had my coat I had my coat hoodie on. I uh I had I had blue I had blue everything on, you know, I'm still supporting no matter what, you know. And this is my signature, you know, my signature hair, so you know, I'm always gonna be you know, I'm on ride or die coach, you know, I'm a coach fan right now. And I'm, no matter what, I'm I'm doing whatever possible to help them get up in terms of the fan standpoint. <laughs> I love it. What about the biggest improvement you've seen in yourself from your rookie season to your second season? What do you think you improved the most on? Because I think the argument could be made that you were the Colts' most active pass rusher before you went down against the Chiefs. What did you see in yourself growth-wise from year one to year two? What did you improve the most upon? Um, the mindset started changing. It's just um, growth, you know. Um, you know, rookie year, you know, you're coming into unexpected. You don't know what to uh, expect. You're coming into something um, you're trying to get used to. So, um, so um, I didn't know what to expect. So, you know, just coming in and just, you know, finishing out that year and just learning from the, the positive and the negative, just jotting everything down and watching film, things I knew I should improve and, uh, watching the sacks that I made, sacks I could have made, and how did I make that sack? And I figured out like I was creating contact, and I was going ahead. And the, the sack that I missed was like avoiding O linemen or whatever. So I just try to improve and try to improve my game, polish it up a little bit, and like just constantly just kept training and just watch watching film from like the past and like what can I do? How can I improve? How can I polish this? And watching understanding the film. Um, and this year I started watching more film this year than, than I ever did in my rookie year. So I was constantly on top of it and just staying on top of it, just trying to be a pro. And, um, and, and, and I took it seriously, you know, and, and it's just, no, well, it's just growth, you know, just learning from experience and it's every, like, you know, as all humans, you know, you, mm-hmm. you just, the only thing you could, you know, the only thing a person can improve is just learning from their mistakes and things. Um, and again, that experience. So I've, I've, dealt with that experience and then just um, um, try to improve that. Who would you say had the biggest impact on your life helping you get to the NFL? Um, it, was, it was my coaches, high school coaches. Coach, um, I started playing football because of my coach, um, Coach Nini. Um, I was a basketball, regional basketball player and I was also a track runner. And um, he was my track coach at the time. He convinced me to play football. So he's, he, was the first, he was the reason why I, I that I play football and for coach, you know, and he motivated me as well. But I was always self driven, but like he made it more fun for me. Um and there was a time that I hesitated not playing football and he um when he he told me that like, I should play when I decided to play and I didn't have any other than anonymous I like, I didn't have any football film, anything. So when I decided to play football, like he took me to a football camp first, um uh, going to my senior year. Um and I went to like I was supposed to go to Syracuse, Camp Rutgers, and then um, Temple. So I didn't um, I was I didn't have a, I didn't really believe in myself. I like was really indecisive of if I should play football. I skipped out on Syracuse, and then um, he knocked on my door, um, you know, like showing that he like believed in me. And K 
prepared and uh, all that, you know, that, you know, all the things that, you know, what you want a person to do, like a, a mentor. So he was a mentor to me and he came out my doors, like we're going to temple. He forced me to go to temple and then I uh, ran a full four there and did what I had to do to be noticed. Um, I mean, unfortunately I didn't get the scholarship there because uh, I didn't have any film. They didn't know what it was about. I was an athlete. I did. I tried to be everybody out there, and then I did good, but they wanted to see a film. So, um, you know, I was, I mean, I was still, I kept my head up, you know, even I didn't get the scholarship. I went to Rutgers, did the same thing, what I had to do uh, at Temple, and then I ran a 4-5 at Rutgers, and um, Kyle Flood, who was uh, who, who was the original coach there, offered me a full scholarship before I even played. And since then, it was like, yo, and, you know, I just try to go up from there. And just kept moving. Um, and once I had that full scholarship, and what I had in the film, so this that year I had 19 sacks, you know, um, 28 tackle for loss, and 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 then that's when I showed Coach Flood that that pass rusher. So and went to you know came in red shirted and went to Rutgers, and then just kept being you know he just kept being around me and just calling my phone. Yeah, do the same thing in college, prove everybody wrong, show them that you that guy. And I had 7.5 sacks. Um, they um, just played third down at uh, Rutgers. I didn't play first and second down. It's a situation of uh, pass rusher there. And I had 7.5 sacks. And I was named one of the freakish uh, um, co- uh, athlete in college football that 2014 year. And uh, had an All-American uh, award and stuff like that. So, And that's what kept motivating me. Just, you know, it was always and sticking by me, him and Coach Smoke, his um, sidekick that was always around me. And parents, of course, it was always, you know, motivating me as well. Wow. So you actually got a full scholarship to a Big Ten school before ever playing a down of football, and then you played football for your first time your senior year where you racked up 19 sacks. My God, your first time ever playing football your senior year, you racked up 19 sacks. That's a crazy – first of all, it's a crazy story getting the scholarship to Rutgers – and then going into your senior year, having never played football before, racking up 19 sacks. That's incredible. And what year, by the way, did you graduate high school? Did you graduate Newark Tech in 2013? 2013. Okay, because I graduated Primus Catholic in 2013 with Jabril Peppers and all them. Jabril was one year younger. He was class of 2014. I was class of 2013. But we probably played. Could we no, play? I, gra- I graduated. No, I graduated 2012. I'm sorry. I graduated oh, okay. 2012. 2012. So we might have played each other. Yeah. You played basketball four years at Newark Tech. Uh, North Tech, yeah, I played basketball uh, my sophomore year to my senior year. Okay, cool, yeah, so, because I know we played Newark Central and we played Newark Tech a couple times throughout the course of, you know, high school, so we might have played each other. Yeah. What about yeah, when, it probably, it probably, yeah. yeah, it was always one of our preseason scrimmages. We would play Newark Tech, Newark Central, PCTI, Eastside, and Christian Brothers Academy, so we probably played each other, that's pretty cool. As we're talking to Colts defensive end Komoko Ture here on the For the Culture podcast, and last year, when you arrived in Indianapolis with the draft class, how long before you realized, wow, this is a special class? Not every class is like this. With two first-team All-Pros, a ton of size, a ton of athleticism, a ton of potential, and also really good character guys off the field as well as talented guys on the field with yourself and Leonard and Nelson and Smith and Lewis and just a ton of guys. The list goes on and on. How long before you realized you were a part of such a special draft class in Indianapolis? I mean, Coach Baller know what he was doing. I was talking to Coach Baller one time. He told me, like, you know, why, like, the type of guys he picked, because they told me that the type of people that they're looking for, they're looking for guys that who, we all have similar uh, similarities in terms of um, what we want. And that's the type of guy Coach Fowler you know, was looking for in terms of his draft class. Uh, we all have that same, something in common. You know, we're all self-driven and we all hate to lose. Or we all, you know, when we do something, we, it's like, it's like you. It's like we 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 go after things that you know we create that bond because we we have all have something in common and we all young, and um and we all have you know, speed and like we all athletic. So we and and, and just having that and but the number one thing is just being self driven and things that you want and uh, and if you have a teammate uh, create and, and, and create a team that we all that have a self 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 that self motivated and also self driven. And that uh, you can't go, you can't, you can't lose with that, because no matter what, a kid get hurt, and, that's, and it's proven facts. Like where we we won, we we won certain games without Darius Leonard. We won, we won games without me. 
and we won games when Ty was out. So it's like it shows that 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 we all it's just that no matter who's out and and it just shows that the the the, the uh the character that 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 each individual has and and shows that no matter what it's bond that we created as a team and is that we can't be stopped and we we don't depend on. We depend on each other, but then that we fight for each other, no matter what. Because if one person lost, we gon' we gonna the person gonna next person up, and we just gonna keep on fighting, no matter what. And we're not gonna be like, oh, we need that person. We we're not losing, because we losing because of this person not here. And mm-hmm. it's like not to bring like it, it just proves in fact it shows right now, and that we've missed so many people like Andrew Love, there is people that got hurt, and they uh, Taquan Lewis, mm-hmm. and we're still winning games because Ballard drafted people that have a same similarity of self motivated and self um driven and that mindset of winning mentality. Mm-hmm. And you can never go low and that and, and that's why we are who we are right now today. Oh, without a doubt. I mean first off to lose your starting quarterback three weeks before the season to retirement and to essentially not even skip a beat and be sitting at four and two right now. To lose your first team all pro linebacker and to be able to go on the road to Arrowhead Stadium primetime television and hold Patrick Mahomes in the Kansas City Chiefs offense to just 13 points speaks volume to every player and coach in this organization. The job Chris Ballard and Frank Reich have done with this team and the job you guys have done and the character of guys you have in the locker room, that next man up mentality, I mean, it's absolutely insane the job you guys have done, just the entire organization up until this point. And how about your relationship with Robert Mathis? What's your relationship with Robert Mathis like, and what has he meant to you as both a mentor and a coach? Uh, Robert Mathis believed in me since day one. Um, he was part of the driving class, um, the recruiting of me when he drafted as well. Um, he's uh, he's seen ability. He seems he he tells me every day like I see something in you. You could be that guy and for the for the coach. And he's like and he seen and he tells me that every day. And he's like, yo, if you want as bad as you, if you want as bad, you gotta, you gotta go for it. And I, and that's also, I feel like that's one of the reason why uh, that I improved this year compared to last year. Um, I didn't, look, I didn't know Robin Matthews like that my rookie year. I was just starting to understand him. Um, my favorite players back then was, you know, Bob Miller and Jason Pierre Paul. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really, to be honest, I didn't really know about Rob Mathis like that. Um, you know, and and it's like just to get to know him and knowing that he's future Hall of Famer and, and that and just being around him and, and his passion ability we have something in common and we understand each other so and I just let I just let him take you know let him take me under his wings and just taught me everything that he knows and then off season I was training with him also off season created a lot of videos and I posted on IG just like also like you know show fans like yo mm-hmm. it's like there was another it was another me coming like another uh, another mindset you know just coming like you know, coming in as a rookie monster, you got the rookie monster, you don't know what to expect and whatever. But, you know, what What I know now compared to, like, my rookie year is, is no is no telling because Rob Mathis taught me a lot, you know, this offseason, just in advice and uh, things to what I need to know, what I need to, things not that not important, how to be a pro and training with him. It's, just, it's all around just how to be successful. And he taught me that. And um, he's, he's a great all-around guy. How about Dwayne Freeney? I know he was at camp over the summer. Did you have a chance to pick his brain at all during training camp? Oh yeah, Freeney was there. Um, um, he was he, he was the other, he was the other person I wanted to see bad too. And, and then he um, and then that happened. He came. Um, he he spoke to all of us, you know, giving us advice. And um, you know, everybody talked about his spin move. Uh, he just tell he just tell you know tell each and individual you know players like yo. Know, you just gotta find yourself, you know. Um, I can't tell you the things that I do because everybody's different, you know. Mm-hmm. And you just gotta be a student of the game, just learn and just like figure yourself out, learn yourself, study yourself. And also say, and he said the same things Robert Matthews said, like things that Robert Matthews do, I may do different. Like everybody do things different. Everybody's everybody's unique in their own individual way. So he gave us that advice. Um, I didn't get to, um, you know, we all been around him. I didn't really get to. Know him as the way I know Rob Mathis, but I mean the advice that he gives us is very useful. 
That's awesome. And you couldn't ask for two better guys, two better pass rushers, and two better Colts to learn from than Robert Mathis and Dwight Freeney. Two guys with each over 120-plus career sacks. Two guys that could one day find themselves in Canton, Ohio, as we're talking to current Colts defensive end, Kamoko Trey here on the For the Culture podcast. And Kamoko, when you look at this D-line room, you have a lot of talent from Autry to Shear to Houston, yourself, Muhammad. Who would you say right now is the leader of that D-line room? I mean, everybody's a leader in an individual way. I mean, you know, fortunately, you know, like like I said, you know, we got guys, you know, we got guys that always, you know, there's that bond. But, mm-hmm. you know, but being that, you know, Jesse Houston and Jabal Shear and they're vets and they're veterans, they've been in the league for so long, and we look up to them, you know, we, you know, we, you know, take, you know, advice from them and stuff like that. But as they, as, they, as you know, just for them being uh, like the, the vets and whatever, they they open up to us like the young guys and they you know take notes from us too like listen and it's like they're not stuck up and whatever they kind of listen to the advice they give us and we listen to the advice they give us and, and of course unfortunately we uh, no of course we won't listen to them because they they've been in the game for a long time and, and they've done it so you know but to pick a leader like yeah I'll say Justin Houston and Jabal Sheard and Janico Autry they all all individuals, they're leaders, and then we look up to each other, and we all help each other. And then, even though when I when I see certain things, I'd be like, "Oh, yeah, you should do this," and then they, they take notes and like, "Okay, appreciate that." Mm-hmm. And then it's just that 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 selfless mindset, and it's no going. And that, that's what carries the team up, and that's what builds that bond and that that don't build that selfishness. Yep, and it plays right into the locker room culture that everybody talks about. Everybody says how great the locker room culture is in Indianapolis. What's your perception of the locker room, and how good is the Colts locker room, in your opinion? Well, the locker room culture is very good. Everybody, each individual position, we all bond with each other. We all talk to each other. And from what I heard, like most teams and other teams, like they, you know, like you just said, like most veterans, they don't talk to like the young guys. They don't really associate the other position. They really don't interact with other guys. Guys just do what they got to do and then go back to their family. Um, unlike like with us, like we just we like we just a lot of bunch of young guys and we're young. We haven't been in the league for so long, but that doesn't matter to us, and we don't think about that. And and uh, we just like with us in the locker room, we 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 got that bond. Like everybody, we got we play we play games in the locker room. We all play different position, play with each other, and like the D line, like each individual position got their own like click. At the end of the day, we like when we all come together, we all come together, we all play around, joke around, and stuff like that. But when we go to practice, we try to have fun with it and stuff like that. Talk smack to each other a little bit and just have fun. <laughs> and what about in practice? What about that iron sharp and iron going up against the offensive line? Right now, I believe they're the best offensive line in the National Football League, going up against guys like Anthony Costanzo and Quentin Nelson. What's that like for you? And how much better does that make you playing guys like that? And how much better do you make them? Getting to play them every week with that iron sharp and iron mentality, with the competition up and down this roster. I mean, we make each other better. I mean, if you can see, if you can see our D line, we don't um, we don't have a lot of big names, and you know, except Justin Houston, and our D line has that name. Um, but like last year, we ain't never had that big name. We was one of the, you know top defensive line in the league, and 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 it carries on. We get we get each other better. We get our alignment better, even though like sometimes we all. Sometimes certain days our alignment, you know, we slack off. Like uh, sometimes the line we slack off. We just try to get each other better, no matter what. And that's why our alignment is the way they are because the D alignment we, we get we keep that standards. We got that standards no matter what. You know, one to the ball. You know, we don't try to give our alignment no break. Mm-hmm. So in the game, it's easy to them because the things that they they our D line give them so much work. So it's like when we go in the game, is the 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 opponents that they're going against is like what nothing. It's like mm-hmm. Think they're going against it's like a little, it's like practice to them a little bit. You know, I try to be disrespectful to other teams, but it's like, but that's that mindset we try to carry. And our line is try to get us better. So we go against those lines, and uh, you see, we get sometimes we get four sacks a game, and a couple of games that we you know we like the Raiders. We probably haven't gotten like certain sacks, but we try to improve and try to work that out, and constantly try to improve, and we never stay down and and try to you know every day is a learning experience. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, without a doubt, it's 100% mutually beneficial for the two position groups, and I think you guys have definitely made each other better over the last two years. And what's it like to play for defensive line coach Coach Fair, and what's it like to play for defensive coordinator Matt Eberflus? Uh, with them, um, 
Five. So we talk about we talk about the the iron sharpened iron. They all start with the upstairs, you know, um, the culture. Um, we won't be who we are if it wasn't for the culture. And leaving that standards, uh, coaches leave the standards, you know, and and we we're, we're bay by them, and and that's what we play the way we play, and and if we have that culture no matter what, just like there's there's structure. And we had that structure. There's uh, improvement. There's, but it's like it's like building a house. If you're building a house, you have to have a blueprint. You know that's what Epiphus always preached. Like he always preached that when you're building, you're, you're building a, a foundation. We're building a foundation. Mm -hmm. It starts with the cement. Everything you wanna, if you want your house to be strong, with tornado coming, with storms or whatever, it's hard to break down. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, and and he he brings that mentality to our mind. Like no matter what. Like it starts on from to bottom up, bottom and to the top. You don't start from a house from top to bottom. It, it, it's a process, trust in the process, and that's what they constantly preach to us every day. And we and we see that, and it's a culture to us, and, and that's we why we got the, the the chemistry we got today because of that. Mm -hmm. How about playing for Coach Reich, and why do you think Frank Reich is right now one of the top tier coaches in the National Football League? What do you think makes him such a good, effective head coach? Um, he's very selfless and he's very understanding of players and um he's trying to he understands players and uh, very reasonable. Um you know and um he try to bring us together, bring the body together. He trusts the coaches and you know, the coaches all trust each other and then and I say it all starts from upstairs, so and whatever he do with the coaches whatever he do with the coaches and the coaches, you know, um come down and do it to us, so it just it all carries on with each other. So um, he's a great coach, and he makes it fun. He makes he makes our job fun, and we go out there and just have fun with it. And last one for you, Kamoko. Before we let you go, what's your favorite thing up until this point about being a Colt? About being a Colt, um, everything like the culture, um, everything, the culture, the players, uh, um, the guys, the older, the Ballard, to him being the best, you know, on GM. That I've seen, I mean, uh, from other things like you that I've been interviewed by, like he's 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 up there. Um, not talking bad about any of the gym, but it's just he just makes he, he makes it fun. Um, and and also like the you know, things that I like most about the Colts, they always they always um, give you feedback on your development, like what you need to work on. Is that there? From what I heard, a lot of you know team doesn't do that, but I mean they try to. They they don't leave you um, confused. Like you won't figure out okay why why is this the way it is. It's like they're always trying to make it you know understandable and show you like what you need to improve on. And we're always getting feedback constantly. Every game we get we get feedback from our game. Every game we play we get feedback. So yeah, so that's what I like about. It. I like that. And then you always know what, what you what you need to improve on. That's what, that's what gets us better every week, you know. Because mm -hmm. we're, also, we're also being reminded, you know. Yep. Awesome, Kamoka. I really, really appreciate you taking time out of your day to be with us on the For the Culture podcast. Give us some insight. Give us an update on your injury. You know, we're all praying for you, praying that you get back to 100% as soon as possible. And we can't wait to see you back out there next year wreaking havoc on quarterbacks around the league. Uh, for sure. Thank you very much for having me on the show. That was Colts defensive end Kamoko Ture joining us right here on the Fourth Culture Podcast.